many of you know someone who is rich? Right? Think through your mind. How many know someone who is rich? How many of you have watched them be rich and had the thought, if I ever get rich, I'll do a way better job at being rich than them? You ever had that thought? I I've got this figured out. I know what I'm going to do when I get to that place when I'm rich. All right. Well, today, one more question. How many of you are rich? You are stinking rich. Anybody? One hand. Two. Oh, look at now you start. Okay, a little bit of this, a little bit of that. All right? You know, it's kind of funny. We all have the dream when we want to grow up that we want to be rich, but yet when you are rich, you don't want to own up to it. You ever notice that? Now, I grew up in farm country, much like this, in the state of Iowa. And do you know what we had around us? Poor farmers. Poor farmers. That's, they, they always talked about being poor farmers. Now, some of them farmed 2,000 acres, but they were poor farmers. They always had that mentality. We're just poor farmers. Okay? So I grew up with that mentality of when you are rich, you're still, oh, I'm still poor. Well, the Apostle Paul gave some advice to a young preacher, his protege, young Timothy. This is what he said to them, him, and this is our text for the next couple weeks, 1 Timothy chapter 6, starting in verse 17, and he said this, Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth which is so uncertain. But to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. In this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age, so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. So if you were rich, this passage would be for you. And it's not a passage that says, hey, kind of, maybe, look at that first word. He tells this young preacher, don't just tell them, don't just warn them, don't instruct them, command them. So if you were rich this morning, this passage would be for you. But the question is, how rich do you have to be to be rich? See, the problem is, is that nobody knows where the rich line is. So how do we define the rich line? Gallup Poll did a study on a group of people at different, wage, at different wages. And they asked this question, how much would you need in order to be rich? They asked a group of people who made around $30,000 a year. And that group, on an average, said, if I made $75,000 a year, I'd be home free. If I just made $75,000, I would be rich. They asked a group of who made $50,000 a year, and the average response was, if I made double what I make now, if I made $100,000 a year, I would be rich. Listen to this jump. They asked a group who made $200,000 a year, how much would it take for you to be rich? $5 million. They asked the question to millionaires, are you rich? The majority of millionaires said no. They have a place for them to respond, and it was, I need X amount dollars more to be rich. And they could fill that in with whatever. Every single one of them had a number of, if I had more, I'd be rich. The challenge is, is if we don't feel rich, 
then we're going to continue to spend our lives trying to get rich. And one day, we're going to actually pass the rich line, and we're not going to even realize that we're rich. And therefore, we're never going to be good at being rich in what really matters most. So today, we're going to start with some good news and some bad news. Okay, now how many know good news, bad news? Sometimes that can go completely the wrong direction for you. Okay, we're going to start with the good news today. Okay, the good news. Are you ready for some good news in your life? Eli, are you ready for some good news? Are you ready? Could you guys use some good news this morning? Here's the good news. You are rich. Man, some of you should be celebrating. You should be happier than that. The good news is you are rich. In fact, let me give you two statistics. The first one is this. If you make $33,000 or more a year. Now, I looked it up. The most recent statistic for McDonough County, which I know is higher than Schuyler County because of the university. So I know that the university has a play in this uh, because their payroll is a little higher than maybe some other places around. But the average income in McDonough County right now is $38,000. Some of you are saying, I'd like to come up to the average. Okay? Bring it on. But if you made $33,000 this year, you are in the top 1% of all wage earners in the world today. You are in the top 1% of the richest people on the planet. Now, we live in a political year where everybody's talking about income, and they're talking about the wealthiest people in the world. If you make more than $33,000, you are in the top 1% of the wealthiest people on the planet. You are rich. Let's take it another step. If you made $80,000 in a year, you are in the top 0.01% of wage earners in the world. You're in the top one-tenth of the top 1% if you make $80,000. That's how crazy rich some of you in this room are. Now let's go backwards. If you made $25,000 this past year, you're in the top 10% of the richest people in the world. If you go down to the poverty line in America, the poverty line in America this year is $11,344. You make less than that, you're considered poor by United States standards. Okay? Listen to this. If you're at the poverty line in America, you're still in the top 13% of the richest people in the world. Even our poor people are rich. Some of you are so uncomfortable with this already. See, we need to change our thinking. We need to change our thinking from that, that poor farmer mentality. We are rich. I am rich. See, now I want to be sensitive when I say this. Because I know for some of you in this room, you have some financial challenges in front of you that are staggering. For some, it may be a medical thing and you've had bills and, and it's really set you back and you're trying to dig out of a hole. Some, maybe you've lost your job and you're struggling to find employment. And you're, you're truly struggling financially. There are those who are single parents who are working multiple jobs to make ends meet. And I know that that can be difficult. And I want to acknowledge that. And I can tell you that we went through our stage of being poor. Okay? I don't know what 300, what is $300 a year, $300 a month for a year. What is that? Somebody tell me. $3,600? $3, the first year we were married, we made 
Uh, Robbie had a stipend that was doing that. I got hurt and couldn't work. So we know what it is to start off poor. Okay? We, we didn't know. It was all of our friends. They were, they were on food stamps, and they were eating better than us. And one of them said to us, well, I said, man, how do you always have good food? I mean, we're eating mac and cheese, and we're eating hamburger helper every meal. Well, we got on this program. We didn't, and and you, we, we could qualify. In fact, when we had four kids, we qualified for everything that there was. But we weren't poor. We weren't poor. We, we still feel like we were rich. So I want you to work with me here today. Even though I know that there are some who are struggling, let's be really honest. Most people who are going to push away and say, I'm not rich, are going to get in a vehicle that is climate controlled. You're going to go home to your climate controlled home. You're going to pick up your cell phone and have a meal catered to your house. You may even take that and take your, your th th camera and take a picture of your meal and post it on Facebook so the whole world knows what you ate today on that phone that has unlimited data and understand we're not all doing that bad. When people in developing countries talk about rich people, they would describe rich people this way. Oh, let me tell you about rich people. Rich people drive past 15 restaurants to get to their favorite restaurant. And then when they get there, they order three meals. They order an appetizer meal, they order a main course meal, and they even have a thing called a dessert meal. That's why they call us fat cats. <laughs> Those rich people, they're so rich, they actually own a vehicle. You know if you own a vehicle, you're in the top 3% of the world. You're wealthy. Some of them people are so rich that they have more than one vehicle. They have two, his and hers. I have six. I have four kids trying to get them to take their own cars. Go, go away. But look at that. I own six vehicles. People in a developing nation can't even fathom that we have one vehicle. They're so rich, they have houses for their cars. And sometimes they're so rich, they can even attach that house to their house and call it a garage. Because they don't want their car to be in the elements of weather. They are that rich that they can have a house for their car. And those garages, even a small one, is bigger than over what half the world would live in. Their homes... How incredible their homes are. They have water in their homes that you could drink. They have a water source that they can go turn a knob and it's drinkable water. That's unfathomable for over half the people on this planet. In fact, they are so rich that they have this little commode thing that they just flush a handle and their human waste goes away. Ours is over in the corner of the room. They are so rich, they have extra rooms in their houses. They're called closets. And they have so many clothes in their closets that they walk, and listen to how rich they are, they can walk all the way through their closet and come out the other side and say, I have nothing to wear. That's how rich they are. See, we now live in a world where over half of the population lives on less than $2 a day. 20% of the world lives on less than $1 a day. 95 million people right now do not have enough food to eat and are starving. 
Over a billion people do not have clean water. Over a million a year will die because they're not drinking clean water. Something that rich people take for granted. We are rich beyond measure. But see, the problem is when I said, you're rich, most of us sit here and we have that same feeling as the poor farmer that, for, the poor farmer that says, I don't feel rich. And I believe that the reason why many times we don't feel rich is because people spend everything they have on themselves. They consume it all. So maybe if you're rich and you don't feel rich, it's because you're consuming all of the resources. The more you get, the more you can have. The more you get, the bigger the house. The more you get, the better the car. The more you get, the more stuff you accumulate. 1 Timothy, that passage, he says, Command those who are rich in this present world, which I hope by now everyone in this room will say, you know what, compared to the majority of people on this earth, I am rich. I'm rich. Command those who are rich not to be arrogant. In other words, don't think what you have is all because of you. Look at me. Look what I've done. Look at my house. Look at my cars. Look at my garage. Look at my stuff. Look what I have done. Now, I don't know if you know any arrogant rich people. I've met a few in my life. And yes, maybe they can say, I have worked hard for this. I have worked, I have, I have busted my tail to be successful and to earn this. I, I invested well. I, I did this and that. But ultimately, in our lives as believers, we have got to come to the place where we recognize that everything we have is a gift from God. Your talent, your ability, your mind, your life. We sang about it today, the air we breathe. Every blessing comes from God. And every blessing that comes from God that we do not return in praise to Him has the potential to become a spot of pride in our lives. Look what I have. Look what I did. Look what I've accomplished. Look at me, look at me, look at me. When everything we have and everything we are should point to Him and Him alone. Solomon said it this way, smartest man in the world, right here. Moreover, when God gives someone wealth and possessions and the ability to enjoy them, to accept their lot and be happy in their toil, this is a gift from God. All wealth, all possessions are a blessing from God. I want us to get this inside of us today. I want us to understand, get our attitude in the right place. We have been blessed by God. I want us to believe that with everything we have, to let that soak into our hearts. I am genuinely rich. In fact, some of you may say, continue to say, no, no I'm not. You don't understand. You may be rich, preacher, but I'm not rich. And I believe, yes, you are. See, the challenge is for so many of us, 
that getting this into our thought process, because I think this is a different way of thinking than normal. It's getting it so that we can understand that I'm rich. And I want to be good at being rich. And the first thing I have to do is admit that I'm rich. So I'm going to have everybody say this with me. Okay? I want you to say, I am rich. Some of you are just like Fonzie. You could not, I am, can't, couldn't apologize. Fonzie could never apologize. Okay? Maybe you could say it, but in your heart you still don't believe it. Well, I could be doing better. I understand that. Some, you don't want to say it because you're embarrassed to say that you're rich. Let me ask you this. What other blessing from God do we apologize for? I don't know this, but when I am blessed with healing, do you know what I want to do? I want to shout it from the rooftop. When I pray for someone to be healed of cancer and they're healed of cancer, do you know what I want to do? I want to shout it to everyone I know. This is a blessing from God. I didn't do it. God did it. So why is it when it comes to our finances, when it comes to our wealth on this planet, that we're all shutting up? Hm. I'm not rich. And most of us believe we're not rich because we always think, well, if I got a raise for 10000 then I'd be up here and then I'd be rich. But understand, the more you say that, the more that line keeps moving. If you can learn nothing from the Gallup poll, learn that. As you move through life, it will always be somewhere ahead of you. And you will never admit that you're rich if you don't say, here's the rich line. And I believe that we can go to the bottom of the, the line. If I can be at poverty status in America and still be wealthier than 87% of the world, I'm rich. It's a matter of what's going on in here. We don't apologize for other blessings. If we truly believe that wealth comes from God, why do we apologize with what God has blessed us with? If you're taking notes, I want you to write down this statement. It should be in there, fill in a blank. God has blessed me with more than I need. I am rich. I want you to say that. It's right there on the screen. I want everyone to say this with me. God has blessed me with more than I need. I am rich. I want you to say it again. God has blessed me with more than I need. I am rich. That's good news. And you really need to know that is really, really good news. You now have rich people opportunities. You can become a blessing to others because of your wealth. You can make a difference because you're rich. That is great news. But now, with the good news comes the bad news. And I want you to brace yourself for awful news. Because as great as that news was, this is awful news. The bad news is, you're rich. The bad news, it was the good news. The good news is, you're rich. The bad news is, you're rich. And being rich is one of the greatest spiritual disadvantages that you will face in your life. Jesus encountered a rich guy in Mark chapter 10. He says, hey, Jesus, I want to be a follower after you. Jesus tells him, go and obey all the commandments. And he says, good news. I've done all that since I was a little kid. I got this. Verse 21 says, 
And I love that it has this phrase in there. Looking at the man, Jesus felt genuine love for him. Hey, Jesus wasn't mad at this guy. Jesus didn't want to hurt this guy. He had genuine love for him, and he's about to speak truth into this man's life. There is still one thing you haven't done, he told him. Go and sell your possessions and give the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. Now, before we get too far, because some have taken this scripture and completely twisted it, okay? So I want you to hear this. <coughs> this is the only time that Jesus ever says anything like this. Excuse me. <clears throat> it's the only time, okay? Scripture does not tell us that we can't have wealth. There are lots of people in the Bible who were wealthy. Okay? They were very wealthy. Some of them were stinking wealthy. Okay? So there's nothing wrong with having wealth. The problem is, is when wealth has you. And Jesus could look into this guy's heart and know wealth had him. His possessions possessed him. And it was all about the stuff. See, God doesn't want wealth to control you. He wants you to control your wealth. That's the problem Jesus saw. So Jesus says, go sell everything. You cannot let things rule your heart. I won't settle for a second place in your life. And the story says that the guy went away sad. He was unwilling to do what Jesus asked him to do. And it says he was unwilling to do that because he had great wealth. In verse 23, it says, Jesus looked around and he said to his disciples, How hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. This amazed them. But Jesus said again, Dear children, it is very hard for those who trust in riches to enter the kingdom of God. In fact, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. The good news is, you're rich. The bad news is, you're rich. And being rich can be a tremendous spiritual disadvantage. So today, I want to wrap this up by looking at three challenges that we are going to face as believers who have wealth. Now, I've been trying to say, I, I did, you know, some of you would probably wish that I would just say, okay, I'm going to draw the rich line here on the carpet. Okay? And here it is. Here's the rich line. And if you're on this side, I'm preaching to you. And if I'm on this side, I'm going to leave you alone until you cross this line. But see, I believe this is a matter of the heart. I love the story of the, the family that was going to a church out in a country church, really small family. And they had a family that was in need. And so they told everybody next week we're going to be taking an offering. This was a long, long time ago, probably 1800s, early 1900s. And there was a family there that they went home and they talked with them, their kids, and their kids, and they worked and they, they came up with 50 cents to give, give them that offering. So next week they went, they had put 50 cents in the offering. And later that day the pastor came to their house and said, hey, we know that you are a needy family and we want to help you. It was the needy family that gave the 50 cents. That was the only thing in the offering. You know why? Because they didn't see themselves being poor. Everybody else saw them being poor. But they didn't see themselves being poor. They knew that they were rich because they had something to give to help somebody else. So don't look at this message and say, show me where the rich line is. Only you can know that. Only you. And some in this room, you're, you're going to be up here and you make this amount of money. And some of you, you're clear. This is where you think some, some would think you are, but you're actually three steps lower than that. You know that feeling? Okay? You present yourself well, okay? But here you are. 
But there's nothing to say that you aren't rich because you don't have what they have. And that's what we have to get out of our mentality, that I have to be as successful as them, and then I'll be rich. When I live in a house like them, then I'm rich. When I drive cars like them, then I'm rich. Because, see, this attitude can mean you have very little. But if you have something to share with others, you are richer than the richest person who won't share with others. It's all in our heart where this lies. Three challenges. We are the rich people. Challenge one, to truly depend on God. I'm convinced, Scripture even states it, it's harder for rich people to depend on God. It's so easy to depend on self. I've traveled outside of the United States several times. I've had the opportunity to do that on missions trips. And I've been able to go to some developing countries where people have nothing. And every time I come home, I try to share this, and I can never really find the words to say what I want to say. On the mountain that we went to in El Salvador, and we met families that are a part of this church, they have absolutely nothing. Very, very little. They wanted to do a meal for us. We begged them not to. And it was the most humbling thing watching them as they brought chickens. And they butchered those chickens that were probably laying eggs for them. And they butchered those chickens so we as Americans could eat a meal there. They weren't eating that chicken. But they sacrificed those animals for us. And you know, I looked at them throughout that entire trip, and I've been there a couple times now, they literally have nothing. My lion, Jared, they got nothing. They live in huts with dirt floors with a hole in the corner or outside the door for a bathroom. They're sweeping dirt floors to keep it clean. If you saw the dishes that they have, they can't, they, they're, they're, most of them aren't even clean. You don't want to, you don't want to know. But do you know what they have? They have a dependence on God that is unshakable, that I do not see in the American church. I don't. They chase after God with such a heart of needing to depend on Him and you know what I, I looked at and I would look in their eyes to see? They have so much joy and so much happiness that I don't see in a lot of people who are going, working in America, have money, have things, and they're miserable. See, they have learned to totally depend on God. When Jesus taught us to pray in what we call the Lord's Prayer, he says, give us this day our daily bread. And I think, how often in our lives have we had to pray that prayer? Now, I can remember a couple times in my life praying that prayer when we were young, married, and had kids. And we didn't know where the next meal was coming from. So I do know how to pray that prayer, Lord, supply. He said, pray it every day. Most days, I do not think about that. Lord, give me food. I go downstairs and I choose from 20 boxes of cereal. Because Robbie's mom gives us cereal by the truckload. Okay? The kids are gone. We still have a cupboard full of cereal. Okay? I come for lunch and I have choices of what I'm going to What am I in the mood for today? I go home, the conversation is, what do you want for supper? I don't know. What are you hungry for? I don't know. We can't even decide what we want for supper because we have so many choices. Give us this day our daily bread. When you're hungry, that's a prayer that's real. 
when you can go to the shelves and you can look in the cupboards and you can look in the fridge and you have multiple choices, you are rich. And when we're rich, it takes away that thought that I have to depend upon God. Who is it that provides your food? God does. Now we're doing a thing for loaves and fishes for this next month. Some of you would do well to go home and purge. Go, through, go, go clean out your cupboards and start over. Okay? Bring that stuff and let loaves and fishes have it. Okay? Just, let's just start over. Purge and do over. It won't take you long to get it filled back up. Okay? But let's, let's use what we have. We're rich to bless them. When we have so much, it's harder for us to depend upon God. Instead, we say, when's my next paycheck? Because my faith is in my paycheck. I'm going to put my, my giftings, my talents to work. I'm going to trust them. That's what's getting me through. When in reality, it all comes from God. Challenge number two is to not be distracted from our true priorities. Wealth can be a distraction for what's really important. I'm going to pick just one area. Church. Okay? Now, I'm going to probably step on some toes, and that's okay. You can pull them in right now. I'm giving us all fair warning. If you're a follower of Jesus, and you can read the New Testament for yourself, I believe that as you read the New Testament, you're going to see that it is important for believers to gather together for corporate worship and prayer. I believe that you can't read the New Testament and walk away and say, that's not important. We would all have to agree, the New Testament paints a picture of the early church coming together every week. It paints that picture. But yet, for some, I believe because they have rich people opportunities, can fall away from that. I remember as a young man, Pastor Winnie, Robbie's pastor in Burlington, Iowa, shared this story. A guy in their church was praying for a boat. He wanted a boat. God, or preacher, pray with me that I get a boat. I need a boat. My family needs a boat. Now, if you have a boat, I'm not... Just hear the story, okay? Prayed for a boat. And you know what God did in his infinite wisdom? He gave him what he asked for. And he got a boat. And you know what? At first it was, man, they would do things and they'd make it to church. But then it got to the place where it was, you know what? We got the boat and the weather's nice this weekend. We're out of here. And then it got to the place where they just completely dropped out of church. And God was not a part of their lives anymore. God gave him what he prayed for. A boat. And yet that thing that could have been a blessing ended up being almost a curse because he let it take him away from a true priority in his life. See, there are many things in life that are good. But when we let them control us and keep us from what we know is a priority, then it's wrong. Okay? And it doesn't matter. Church is just one thing. You could pull out a hundred different things. But a lot of times we let those rich people distractions keep us from the Word of God. Rich people distractions keep us from a time of prayer. Rich people distractions keep us from the house of God. Things that are blessings and God has blessed us. And sometimes those things are hurting us. Those rich people distractions because they're keeping us from what's really important. Challenge number three to not shy away from our responsibilities. 
with great wealth comes great responsibility. We've all heard that. We have a great responsibility because what God has given us. In Luke 12, Jesus said, From everyone who has been given much, much will be demanded. And from the one who has been entrusted with much, much more will be asked. And we need to understand. When Jesus said that, he's speaking to John Keck. He's speaking to you. Much is required. See, and that's bad news for some. Just like the rich young ruler. Because we have a lot. And we don't want to part with it. Or we don't want to give. That becomes bad news for us. We go back to our text in verse 18. It says, command them to do good. To be rich in good deeds. To be generous and willing to share. See, the bad news is, more is expected of us. Because more has been given to us. And as a church, hear me. As a church, it's time that we admit that we're rich. This is something that God had began to lay on my heart as we were finishing up our building program. And it's actually connected to that wall with all of our missionaries on there. Because what God planted in my heart was this. In the last, and some of you know this, we built a $1.5 million building for $700,000 because of all of the volunteers that we had. That's huge. But in that same time frame that we raised $700,000, we gave $350,000 to missions. You know, and I have people that want to pat me on the back and say that's great. But here's what God challenged me. Now that this distraction is done, what can you do? Now that this is done, can you get back to business of what needs to be done? I truly believe that in a few weeks when we head into our missions convention, that this is going to be our greatest year ever. And that what we pledge to do next year is going to be even greater. Why? Because we're going to wake up and realize I am rich. And God is giving me rich people opportunities. When I, was a, when I was a youth pastor, a, a guy challenged me about Speed the Light. Another youth pastor. And he said, man, you should get your kids to give $2 a week. That's a cheeseburger and a Coke. Get them to sacrifice a cheeseburger and a Coke. And for many years, I did that. I begged kids to give 2 bucks a week. And then you know what happened? I started looking at what kids were wearing. Some of those kids were wearing tennis shoes that cost it back then 60 to 100 bucks. They were wearing jeans that cost 50 bucks. And I'm begging them for two bucks for missions. And it changed me. So no longer am I going to beg for a little minimum thing. I'm going to say, hear the voice of God. What would he have you do? And you know what? It was always more than the two bucks a week. I saw kids go from giving $104 a year to giving thousands of dollars a year. Why? Because they were hearing the voice of God, and God was bigger than that little thing. See, we have rich people opportunities, and we're going to invest in things that are what's best, and that's things that are eternal. Okay, we, have, we have invested in this building, but understand, we've built this building to reach souls. We've built this building so that 160 kids can pile into it. That's why we've built this building, so that people can hear about Jesus Christ. This is a tool. 
So I know when I was given to this building, I was not thinking I'm buying carpet, I'm buying a chair, I'm buying paint, I'm buying concrete. Every time I wrote that check, I'm thinking about, Lord, this is an investment in the kingdom for souls. Because this is eternal. And we have built a tool to reach people because people are what's eternal. And we are going to invest. We're already doing that. We're investing in kids. We're investing in young adults. We're investing in teenagers. The statistic has now jumped. 93% of people who come to the Lord do so before the age of 18. A church that doesn't have children's ministry and youth ministry is missing the whole point. Because that's the harvest field. That's where people are open more to the gospel. Only 7% of people come to the Lord as an adult. Now, I don't like know about you, but I like to fish when the fishing's good. Okay? I don't want to throw out and cast a hundred times to catch, catch one fish. I want to fish where the fishing's good. So we're going to invest. We're investing in our children's ministry. We're investing in our youth ministry. We're investing in our young adults. We're spending money on those things. We're investing in missionaries who are spread out across the United States. We're investing in missionaries that are literally spread out all around this world. And we can do that because we have rich people opportunities that we can give. We can do our best. And this is going to be a church that is so full of generosity that we are going to be great at being rich in the things that matter most. And I believe with that kind of love and that kind of generosity, it's going to get people's attention. And people are going to stop and say, what's that about? I love when people come to look at this church that don't know the Lord, and we get to this point right here, and they see that wall. Uh, what's that about? Let me tell you what that's about. That is about the love and generosity of a congregation that gets it. They get it, and they love people, and they love things that are eternal, and they're investing what they have in things that are eternal. And one day, on heaven's shore, there's going to be a reward. In fact, the text says this, in the same way, they will lay up for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age. Not in this world. So that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. That's eternal life. We are investing ahead. And man, I want you to know as your pastor, I'm not going to apologize for having a missions convention. I'm not going to apologize for parading people up here saying we can do our best because I believe we can do better than we've ever done. I believe that we are rich people and when we grasp a hold of that and see that we have the opportunity to invest ahead, that that is the greatest investment of our time, of our energy, of our wealth, of our finances. We're going to become good at being rich with whatever God has blessed us with. We're going to become rich in what matters most. I want you to bow your heads with me today. Today, my invitation to start off is simple. It's simply those who would say, I acknowledge that God has blessed me. 
I acknowledge that I am rich. Now, it doesn't matter how much you make. You may be the richest person in the room, or you may be the poorest person in the room. But I believe the poorest person in the room can be, be rich, if you understand. But today you would say, I am rich. And I want to be good at being rich. I want to be good at being good at doing the things that matter most. And I'd like for you to pray over me that God would help me do that. If you're in this place, I just want you to simply raise your hand right where you're at. You'd say, that's me. Yes, yes. Lots of hands. Father, today I thank you for your presence. I thank you for the blessings that you have put into our life that we neither earned nor deserve. They are truly blessings from you. And today, we are declaring that we want to be rich in things that will bring you glory, that will help other people come to know your Son, Jesus Christ, as their Lord and Savior. And I pray that there would be a shift in our thinking and that we would truly grasp that you have let us be born in one of the richest countries in the world. And you have given us and blessed us so much. And today we lay our wealth at your feet, whether it's a little or whether it's a lot doesn't matter. What matters is that we lay it at your feet and say, Lord, here it is. And if you bless me and I make more, it's yours too. And if you take something away, that's okay. It was never mine. We know that you're a sovereign God and you give and you take away. And we acknowledge that. But with whatever you give us, Whatever you bless us with, we are going to be rich. Father, change us. Change our way of thinking so that we can truly do more for your kingdom. May we see the rich people opportunities that we have and may we take them. I pray that this would be a church full of rich people who are good at being rich, being generous, doing good, making a difference, serving you, honoring you with their lives. And we recognize the responsibility that since you have blessed us, that you require of us more to be more generous, to be more giving. And we answer that call. Teach us to be good at being rich in a way that will honor you. I pray this now. Before we leave this place, I want to go back to the story of the rich young ruler. He went away sad because he wouldn't surrender what he had to Christ. Some of you in this room, there are things in your life that are holding you back. It may be your wealth. It may be your riches. It may be things, possessions. And today the Holy Spirit is speaking to you. Why not let me have that? Because I'm not going to take second place to anything in your life. Today, I want to give you an opportunity. 
And I want to pray over you as well, where you would say, John, that's me. There's something in my life that I have been holding on to. And today I need to let it go and put Christ back first in my life. If you're here, I just want you to slip up your hand again. Is there anyone here that would say, that's me? Yes. Is there anyone else? Yes. Yes. Father, today I thank you for the honesty and the integrity of those who have just raised their hand, because I know that can be hard. But Father, it is, it is simply acknowledging that you are Lord, and we are putting you first in our lives. And we're not going to let anything be second place to you. So we surrender to your Lordship. We lay everything before you. And we praise you. We praise you today. Let's stand today. Let's, let's close by singing this song, Great Are You, Lord. In our lungs, so we pour out our praise to you. Mm-hmm. Father, hear, hear our song, but see our hearts. You are our great Lord. And we will give you praise for every blessing. For every blessing. We will not let it turn into a measure where we can become prideful about it. But we, this week, will look for opportunities to be generous. We will look for opportunities to be good at being rich. Father, let this this message just permeate through our lives. May it catch us each and every day. May your Holy Spirit bring us back to this as we begin this thought process. And Father, I pray that your blessing will be upon this church family, both for those who are here and those that weren't here today. God, I pray your blessing upon each one. Thank you for letting us be the body of Christ together in this place pray that you would just continue to unite our hearts together. Let us be family with one another. Let us truly care about one another. And I thank you. I thank you for that blessing. We pray this now in Jesus' name. Amen.
God bless you. Greet one another as you go today.